Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. I'm your host, Stephen Pinecker, and folks, I am so excited about the guests that I'm having on my program today. Now, as many of you know, as I told my story on Mormon Stories, I was an atheist for a very long time. And one of the people that I really, really enjoyed and got a lot of great information from uh, was uh, this guest of mine, Aaron Ra, is in the house. Welcome to the program, sir. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, so basically, you know, some of you faithful, now just so you know, uh, I just did a, commu- a poll on my commu- community page on YouTube, and about a third of my audience is atheist and or agnostic, and another 10% are deists. So almost 40% of my audience uh, is not necessarily theist. And um, and that's so I thought it's important to hear all the voices of the restoration, including some of the critics, some of the people who uh, maybe don't uh, cons- don't believe in God. Uh, believe that all scriptures are man-made, and uh, and that and that you are. And one of the reasons I had you on this show is one, you have you did have a history uh, of of Mormonism in your in your past, which I'd like to talk a little bit about. But I also want to talk about this new program that you have, uh, the series that you have on your program, in which you are uh, doing a series like a read through of the Book of Mormon. Now, to this is what makes this so cool is he's done it with the Quran, he's done it with the Bible and other scriptures. You're not just going after just Christians. You're 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 going after all theists, which I respect, dude. I totally respect that. And um, and you're currently doing a series on the Book of Mormon. I, I'm just curious, what made you decide you wanted to do that? Well, I'd never read the Book of Mormon. I have in my in my <clears throat> I went through a series of years of where I just I had the opportunity to be on a learning curve. I was I was working a job that that gave me unlimited overtime, but it demanded very little, and sat me in front of a computer with an internet connection. So I read, and I I read and I read and I read. So I mean, just imagine working for 10, 12 hours a day, but all you're doing is reading for the most part. I mean, there's very little. I mean, I, I have to man a station essentially, but it's all my time. So I'm just reading. So I read the Bhagavad Gita. I read the some of, though not all of, the Avestas of Zarathustra and and. Uh, a lot of uh, Greek mythology and so you know comparative mythology, bits of uh, bits of um, uh, Guru Nanak. I forget the Sikh desert. The, the, get bits of the Sikh scriptures and such. And well, I haven't read all of those yet. I and mean, one thing that was surprising that I hadn't read was the Book of Mormon because mm-hmm. I was raised, you know, by a Mormon. I was I was baptized as Mormon as a child at eight years old, but I never identified with Mormons. Because I couldn't tell. I mean, I, th- I thought it was a logical question. I mean, how can you, how can you assume that just because your parents belong to a particular religion that you belong to that religion? Because I, I didn't see religion as a culture. I saw religion as a belief, right? So this is something you believe or don't. If you, if you believe these sets of tenets, then when you compare every, every, everything that everybody believes, well, that puts you in this box, right? But I, being a small child, I hadn't. I, how did I know that I had that I believed everything necessary to be a Mormon? How do I how do I know that I don't believe that what I believe or or how do I know that not having read the scriptures and not having any idea what they teach? I mean, how would I know that I didn't resonate better with Hindus or 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 something else? So I would not identify as Mormon. People would ask me, you know, are, what religion are you? And already I know that there's a problem because if somebody asks me if somebody cares what my religion is. I, I just know that that's going to be an issue. Hmm. That's that's something I figured out as a kid. And I would always answer, I say, well, my family is Mormon. And I thought it was pretty obvious that there's a comma there and that the most likely word to follow that comma is going to be but. But the people didn't seem to pick up on that ever. I mean, and I, I rarely got to explain, you know, that, that, that I don't identify as Mormon. And I'm talking about as a child, as a 12 year old boy, I'm, I'm in this position. And, but they would just immediately start telling me, the crazy things that Mormons believe. Really? So you're going to, I tell you that I'm Mormon. So now after I tell you that I'm Mormon and I didn't tell them I'm Mormon, but they think I did. Mm -hmm. So after I tell them I'm Mormon, they're now going to tell me what I believe as if I don't know what I believe. That may work for all of the other people who assume that, well, my parents are Catholic, so I'm Catholic, but that didn't work for me. Right. And I don't understand how it works for anybody. How can you how can you tell a Catholic all the crazy things that a Catholic believes? And the Catholic will say, oh, I didn't know we believed all this crazy nonsense. And this is usually coming from Baptists. 
So excuse me, let's talk about your own wheelhouse, shall we? <laughs> let's look at all the crazy shit you believe. So it, I got to see uh, when I when I was living in in the, the Four Corners area, I was living in Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, Nevada, you know, for a lot of my childhood. And and when I was in those areas, there were places that if you weren't Mormon, you weren't employed. So that's you know, that's it. You were Native American, Mexican, or you were Mormon. And so if you're not Mormon, then there's something wrong with you. And 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 so just everybody was was you know, all of the white people were Mormon in those areas. And then you know, I would because my I had a very chaotic child childhood and I spent about half of my time in Los Angeles area. And so I would go back to LA and suddenly being Mormon isn't the norm. Suddenly being Mormon is a freak show. So I got to experience what it is when a Hindu or a Sikh comes over to this country and has to explain what religion they are. And then, then suddenly they get the stark reactions and everything. And I got to see inter, uh, interdenominational bigotry mm -hmm. because now I have the Baptists who are telling me all of the other Christian denominations who are not Christian because the Catholics are Mary worshiping pagans. The Jehovah's Witnesses are just a cult. The Mormons are just a cult. Everybody else is just a cult. Everybody except them. <laughs> right. So, and, and the funny thing is I also saw the hypocrisy because these people would be standing on my front doorstep telling me all the crazy things that Mormons believe. And I'm like, really? You want to step inside my house and tell my mother that she believes all these crazy things? Oh, the answer would always be no. Hmm. They don't want to go in and tell my mom who worked at the temple what she believes, because while I had never read the Book of Mormon, I knew she had. She knows what they believe, right? Mm -hmm. but Baptists don't like to have their preconceptions confronted by hard realities they they want to believe what they want to believe and that's it and then, and that's just not that's not just a statement for baptists i mean that's a statement for you know it, for for I, I see it as faith across the board people just want to believe what they want to believe there's some people that are that way mm -hmm. and i want the things that i believe to be true but the balance is that if it's not true, I don't want to believe it. And if it, and if it's and if it if it, you don't have to prove that it's wrong, like other people say, can you prove absolutely hundred percent for certain that there's no God? Because that's what they want for there being no God. Right. And I can say no, but I can I can prove for absolutely hundred percent for certain that there is evolution. Well, I can do that. But no, you can't. Oh, you can't. Yeah, you can. Yeah. But then there's this huge conflict mm -hmm. because they will deny any and all evidence against their belief whether it's whether it's for another position that they're objecting to or whether it's against the one that they're holding to but for me i don't you don't have to disprove what i believe all you all it is that i require is that to find out that it's not as well supported as i thought it was if it's not supported well enough to hold it at all i've already stopped believing it hmm. and so uh, any apologists who might be listening to this you, you you might want to be aware that i have that i've spoken with all the, the all of the leading creationist apologists you know i i think uh, for for christianity at least in the western world uh, and some muslim apologists as well and just everybody that comes to me with e with arguments instead of evidence they're always based on logical fallacies without fail every time a Christian has cited a scientific paper saying this says this that is against evolution. But if you're in a live debate, there's nothing you can do with that, right? I mean, how can you? Yeah. You know, but but in a written debate, which I I vastly prefer, in a written debate, you're like, oh really? Let me let me before I finish typing up my reply, let me read the thing, mm -hmm. and and see that oh look at that, it didn't say that at all. It actually says the opposite of that. What the hell are you doing? Quote mining from this. Yep. Yep. <laughs> 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 so I never identified as Mormon, and I remember my mother would tell me all the time that I should read the Book of Mormon, that it would convince okay. me. Hmm. And I thought, well, the Book of Mormon is based on the Bible, right? Okay, yeah, okay. So if I, I mean, the Quran is based on the Bible too. So, and I knew that much even as a kid. So, so if I read the Quran, is that going to reveal the truth? Oh no, the Quran's not going to. Well, what what is the commonality here? The Quran and the Bible are both based, or the community, the Quran and the Book of Mormon are both based on the Bible. The Bible is their foundation. You guys are always talking about a solid rock foundation rather than shifting sand and all that kind of crap, right? So what's this foundation? Let me look at the Bible, 
and the Bible was wet tissue paper. The Bible just collapsed. Hmm. So how can we build on that the Quran or the Book of Mormon, which are perilously similar in a few ways, by the way? The, the, the Quran has more hate, and and the 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 Book of Mormon has more. Um, let's give Joseph Smith what he wants, as you would expect. Hmm. Interesting, interesting observation. So you decide you are going to read the Book of Mormon. Yeah, uh, let's talk about that. Well, so far, I have to tell you that when I read the Bhagavad Gita. I had already seen a lot of artwork for the, the, the Krishnas. I had, um, I, I, I pondered that. I, I read books by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, you know, like the science of self-realization and things like that. I'd read uh, Krishna books, and I, I felt very sympathetic to the, the whole concept of, of reincarnation and then, you know, the and the, the balance of the karma and all of that. I love that, all of that Eastern philosophy. It kind of lost me whenever they start talking about gods because then, then we're just talking about Zeus and Hera and it's all just meaningless. It's all just stories of, you know, what Odin did to Loki. I don't care, you know. But as far as the philosophy part, I was really into that until I read the Bhagavad Gita. Hmm. And I was reading that in much with the same way when I read the Bible. When I read the Bhagavad Gita, I was sincerely expecting that I'm going to be reading wisdom and compassion and, and higher philosophy. That's what I thought. And when you start into the book, it introduces you to King Arjuna. And Arjuna is my man. I mean, just I mean, right, right out the gate. I'm like, I, I, I like Arjuna. He, he's not going to fight against his family and kin. They're coming after him. And he, and he says, you know what? The noble thing to do in this case would be to throw down my arms and let them kill me rather than raise a weapon against my own kin, the people that I love. That's, I can't do this. And I'm like, I love Arjuna right away. Sorry. Krishna shows up and just perverts all of it oh. and, and, and tells Arjuna, no, you, you have to, cause you're the warrior caste. And so you have to go, you, you have to go kill all these people, but don't worry about it. Cause you're only killing their bodies. You're not killing their souls. And I'm thinking, okay, well, if, if that's the logic, then why is it that we're not allowed to eat meat in this religion? It's because that's the body that, that is now inhabited by the soul we used to kill. So we can't kill it when it's a cow, but we can kill it when it's a person. Hmm. Do you, how, did, how do they not notice the glaring hypocrisies there? So when I read the Bible, much the same thing. I thought that, the you know, I was always told that God is love and that God is wisdom. And that when I read the Bible, I'm going to get divine wisdom. And of course, you don't got you don't get three pages into the Bible. If you open from any place, you can't get three pages into the Bible without realizing that this this was written by inferior beings. Mm. This was this was written by beings beings with great prejudice and extreme ignorance, and they're they're highly bigoted and they don't know anything they're talking about, like ever. So blinding ignorance and 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 sexism and racism and just and it was the smallest minds i could imagine is what was what is conversing to me through the bible it's, it's i found it repugnant hmm. i ended up throwing it across the room in disgust and praying to god that he had better account for himself because i still believed in god i mean i couldn't believe in the bible but it, but you know the bible is not god there's another thing that creationists don't understand the bible is not god right if the Bible's wrong, that doesn't mean that God's wrong, right? Because God didn't write the Bible. <laughs> People wrote the Bible, and that's why the that's why the Bible is full of absolute nonsense. All of these in, uh, inconsistencies and contradictions and atrocities and absurdities. All of the, that people wrote that. Were they inspired by God? Well, I don't think there is a God, and, and the Bible, Bible's a large reason for that. I mean, there was a poll done in one of the American Atheist National Conventions for, you know, American atheists tend to be overwhelmingly, they were raised as Christians. Yep, that's very true. So uh, the question was, you know, why why did you uh, abandon your faith? And the tertiary reason was the, was the surprising thing. It was, it, it was scientific explanations. That was number three. Hmm. The number two answer, and this was 
this was well over a decade ago. I think this was like 20 years ago when they did this. So it, this, the secondary answer was the hypocrisy of the church. Hmm. And just imagine how that answer would be now, today. It, we know so much more than we did 20 years ago. The hypocrisy of the church is just, it's astounding. But the number one answer for why American atheists were born Christian, raised or were raised Christian, but no longer believe in God, they read the Bible. That'll do it. I As Penn Jillette said, we need more atheists, so read the damn Bible. Read it cover to cover. Put it on your summer reading list. Hmm. Uh, well, well, I appreciate you saying these things, Aaron, because this is what you believe. But it's also you're a man of integrity, and I, I think, and a man of consistency, and that's what I respect about you tremendously. Uh, and you're not a coward. Um, I have to say, there are. A few cowards out there, uh, I think sometimes <laughs> I've reached out to Christian apologists uh, who I've said, if you want to come to my program, you can and uh, crickets. And how I'm much so money did you offer? I didn't offer him any money. <laughs> well, there you go. I was for you. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's interesting because a lot of the Christian apologists don't want to deal with me because one of my friends said, well, they're, they don't want to deal with you, Steve, because they're bullies and uh, they don't they know they can't bully you. That, um, and yeah. they're carnival barkers. I oh, mean, no. all, all the Christian apologists, it's all, about, it's all about money. I mean, let's talk about our good buddy, Ken, Kent Hovind here. Now, I told you, I know you don't believe in God, Aaron, but I think you're doing the Lord's work uh, taking that guy down. Um, and we want to get back to the Book of Mormon. We have to talk about <laughs> Kent Hovind because this guy is a charlatan. This guy is also a malevolent actor. And he is not somebody that we, he's, he's a dangerous person. And I think he's somebody who is 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 is, is a disgrace. To and uh, I think that what you are doing is so important to show this guy is a fraud. And if, if you don't know about him, this guy is based out of he was based in Pensacola, Florida. He did a series uh, he, until he got brought, busted on over fifty counts of fraud, yes, three different exactly. types of fraud, yeah. and spent virtually a decade in prison. <laughs> yeah, and then after that, lost his family, but they kept the family business going. But then he starts Dinosaur Adventure Land out there in Alabama, and it's just uh, it's one big where rift. a child died unsupervised in a water hole and. And 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 Ken Hoven said, but the rest of the family had a great time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Um, how do you have how do you have so little yeah. compassion, so little awareness of yourself that you would say something like that? I know, I know. I mean, dude, like I said, uh, I just I just said, folks, check out Aaron stuff when he's dealing with Ken Hoven. Uh, I think it's important that he's documenting this and showing just step by step the fraud the fraud the, the fact that he'll he'll use an argument even though he's shown conclusively that this is incorrect he goes back and just keeps on using it there's no intellectual integrity with this guy and see that's what see that's what ticks me off dude because they're doing it in the name of my faith and i think there aren't any christians that are doing christians should be doing the job that you're doing dude but they're not and so that's why i say you're doing the lord's work sir well you've got a few i mean you've got um, uh francis collins yeah, and Kenneth Miller, and to a lesser degree, Robert Bacher was at one time, but he he's kind of dropped out of the game now. Um, and and Miller uh, still had uh, he's worked with me on a couple of things, and I'm I'm proud to say that, you know. And he was he was so friendly with me that I was was on the verge of calling ourselves friends. Huh. Yeah. Wow. Well, and that's the other thing too that I really like. You know, somebody in my private group, you know, I posted in in my private book on Facebook that I was going to have you on. And somebody said, you ought to watch his discussion with inspiring philosophy that was done with the beer uh, consortium, beer and Bible yeah. consortium over there in Texas. And I watched a little part of your presentation. Then I watched a little part of inspiring philosophy's presentation, but I, I, I keyed in on the conversation, the dialogue that the two of you were having. And I thought it was very respectful. And I thought that you guys had a, a, a good conversation. So there are good, there are you know, Christians out there that are doing a good work, but also engaging. And I like the fact that you are engaging other Christians and that you will talk to them. You'll come on this program. And, uh, but there isn't enough of that in my mind, but I, I do want to just 
give you a shout out, sir, for like everything that you're doing. I think it's important that people be educated in the realities of biological evolution. Uh, you know, I was taught in Christian schools, young earth creationism. It was when I finally, uh, as I was leaving the church, I'd like, I tell myself, tell people, uh, I read myself out of Christianity. And one of those things that I read myself out with was, was science books. And I read a lot of the scientific papers, a lot of books, just so I could properly understand evolution and actually get it right you know as opposed to the uh the straw man arguments that they would use the creationists would use and and that's what really killed me dude because when i i read the book um i i thought you know like i i, I thought i was really smart you know i was just i had a calvinist background i was really good at debating and then I thought, you know, I don't know anything about atheism and Christian apologetics. I know there's these really smart guys and they go to do these debates with atheists and they win all these debates, you know. So then I pick up Josh McDowell's answers that the evidence that demands a verdict. I'm like, I'm going to pick up this book. And within within two minutes, I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> it's a, this, this, this ain't good, man. I was just like, so like, oh, no. And that really what kind of started the whole like okay like i don't know about this like because because that's when i realized that the christian apologists were not actually there engaging the world the atheist world the secular world all they were doing was just putting out these books to keep people in the church and that's all that it was and that's what i recognized right away so that's why you won't hear me making a whole lot of christian apologetic arguments because the they're they're very weak and and you guys the, the, the atheists you demonstrate that all the time well, thank you very much for that. I, I, I am always been fascinated by evolution, just the fluidity of life that, you know, and, and the best analogy I can make for it is language because people have a tendency, as you said, a straw man, you know, and they, they, they will ask questions like, well, when, when did a fish decide to grow legs and walk on land as if a, a single individual made a conscious decision to suddenly change itself entirely and go walking around? But really, we're talking about population genetics. So we're talking about something that takes, that's not just one individual. It's it, it's it's genes that may arise at first in one individual, but it's not evolution until it gets, to, until it's inherited by descendants. And then through you know, the population mechanics, it gets, you know, shared throughout the population so that that same gene is now in a group of different uh, different individuals. And when you have one population that is divided you know, so you have now each one is developing their own unique mutations, which change the physiognomy. And and those, if there's no more gene flow between them, they're they're isolated some way. And there's there's other ways for this to happen too. There's a, like there's at least four, if not to a half a dozen different types of speciation that can be happening. But the simplest one to understand is if you have one population divided. The smaller the population, the faster they evolve because the parent gene pool has a tendency to inhibit expression of new genes so the smaller population has a, liar, a higher probability of expression for those new genes and the new genes that appear here are not going to appear in that other group because there's no gene flow between them so if you have this one population divided into two sets with a natural boundary between them say say a say a wasteland of some sort then it won't be very long before if you find some intrepid interloper in the no man's land between them you can just by looking at it tell which group it came from because of the unique distinctions. Well, this is the Southern type versus the Northern type, you know, where every member of this group shares the same trait that is not shared with any member of the other group. And then it continues on because the more genetically diverse they become, not only the more distinct they are, uh, but the, the the lower the probability of interbreeding, so that there's a higher probability that the 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 offspring will be infertile, and then as it continues on, then the higher the probability that the offspring will be inviable, and then once there's once they don't interbreed anymore at all, well then all of that inhibition by the dominant gene pool doesn't even matter anymore, because now they're they're completely distinct, and so they're uh, utterly uninhibited. And that was the thing that Carolus Linnaeus had a problem with when he first devised taxonomy in 1735. He realized that, that everything fits into nested categories. I mean, a family tree of life. This is the way he categorized them. And he knew that, that that's this is this is real. This is the way they actually are. This is the way they have to be defined. There's no other way. And indeed, you know, hundreds of years later, we've confirmed, yeah, he was right. This is actually how they have to be defined. It is completely against the creationist concept, the 
orchard that they like to talk about. Because creationists now will accept that evolution happens. They'll even accept that speciation happens. But they want to put it within limits. And they can never identify what the limits are. And they also want to say that Darwin was a racist when he was absolutely not. And they want to say that Hitler was a Darwinist when he absolutely was not. Mm. Uh, Hitler wrote in Mein Kampf that, uh, that evolution could only occur within kinds and by that he meant the same thing that the bible means by kinds with the hebrew word min which means whether they can whether they're closely related enough that they could reproduce and still produce fertile offspring to bring forth after their kind this is what hitler's talking about he says they can only reproduce within a species but that the evolution of new species he said in mein kampf was a sin belief in it belief in the in the in the evolution of new species was a sin against the eternal creator so hitler was Damn Skippy, not not a not a, a a Darwinist in any sense. I mean, Hitler was a creationist, overtly. Mm. Yeah, that, that doesn't mean that some of the other people that that you know, like they 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 want to say, well, if you if you're an evolutionist, a ridiculous word because they, they need to make a, create a a a uh, an illusion of false equivalence, so that everything you believe, for whatever reason you believe, it all becomes a religion somehow, even if it's based on evidence, even if it's not necessarily a belief, but it's something that's a demonstrable fact of nature. They want to put every perspective as if it's a religious belief, something that requires faith, because they realize that a that a wholly faith based position is defenseless unless everybody else is equal. So that's 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 why they argue that way. So Carolus Linnaeus realized that speciation has to be happening here. But he said, back in the 1700s, the only way a new species could come about is by a special creation by God. Mm. Okay. Yep. But it was perplexing to him because mm. he keeps looking at these and he goes, these have to be related. This and this are clearly the same thing. They're just slightly different varieties of the same thing, yet they cannot interbreed. But there's, they're obviously very closely related. They, they, you can't distinguish them. You know, foxes and dogs, things like that. I mean, they're so close. I mean, they're clearly the same thing, but they don't interbreed. And why would God come down and say, okay, oh, I want, I'm, I'm going to make foxes. I'm going to make a silver fox. I'm going to make a, a red fox. I'm going to make a fennec fox. Why would you do that? Why would you, why would you not just create a fox and let the fox diverge into all of these others? And if you're going to do that with the foxes and you can do that with the dogs, well, why, why not have an initial canid that does it with foxes and dogs? And Carolus has figured all this out without any access to the fossil record. He didn't know there were fossils. Right. So th that that came on. It, that was this was all right on the heels of of his research. Then they started finding fossils, and now we have intermediates that uh, are we're throwing everything askew. Right. So th that's when they found out that we started figuring out uh, that dinosaurs were not as they were advertised even throughout my childhood they were dinosaurs were advertised as being cold-blooded sluggish reptiles but it was 150 years ago they knew better hmm. because there's studies that i've that i've read by uh, like not, uh, not william b but uh, uh harry h Seeley and thomas huxley and so and and even uh sir richard owen they're they're real they're realizing these things were fast powerful warm-blooded pound for pound they were better stronger and faster than we are dinosaurs were more advanced than mammals like if any any dinosaur versus mammal pound for pound equal size the dinosaur is going to win you know that's, that's just the, it the only reason we're here <laughs> is it took an asteroid to take them out <laughs> so, <laughs> they had a high food consumption and so the only things that survived that impact, I mean, the only large things are like uh, crocodiles, famously, oh, yeah. who can go a month without eating mm -hmm. anything yeah. because their metabolism is so low. And while crocodilians are, um, they're archosaurs and dinosaurs are archosaurs as well. They're both on opposite ends of the scale. And in between the, the dinosaurs are the hyperactive, super aerobic, the super high energy things. They had to eat like a ton just, you know, to sustain themselves where crocodiles barely had it all. But, but there was another intermediate between the dinosaurs and the crocodilians called the crocodilomorphs. And there's a huge range for plant-eating crocodile types, uh, for high-speed terrestrial running predators. Imagine that. Imagine a long-legged, fully terrestrial, high-speed, galloping <laughs> crocodile yeah. with hooves. Because <laughs> some of them had hooves. Wow. <laughs> That's crazy. 
And some of them were prey items that had like heavy armor. And I mean, these are crocodilian types, right? I mean, these, are, these are the closest living things we have in the world are crocodiles. Yet here's this thing with all this armor plating and spikes and all this stuff to, to defend itself against the other crocodilomorphs of its time. There were arboreal crocodilomorphs. Just think about that. I mean, the, the world was really bizarre. There were some of them that walked around on two legs hmm. and looked very much like what we used to think dinosaurs looked like about 100 years ago. If you go, we go watch the old black and white movies from 100 years ago, we now know that dinosaurs are not like that, but the crocodilomorphs were. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. Uh, you know, Aaron, whenever you're on, we always have to talk about biological evolution because that's your wheelhouse. But we have... I have a, but we need to get back to you reading the Book of Mormon. Now, I think, <laughs> I think, I think we see where this is going because you, 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 you pretty well said a lot of things about the Bible. And if it's based on the Bible, then you probably aren't approaching the Book of Mormon with a, you're, you're probably thinking there's probably, it's not going to go well. You're probably not going to read the divine word, at least what's claimed. <laughs> this, this be, uh, that's okay. Dogs are, you told me that you had dogs. Um, yeah. It's maybe, a great Pyrenees. He barks constantly. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Belcor. Shh. Good, good boy. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I want to get back to you um, reading the Book of Mormon, but also your Book of Mormon series that you have on your channel. Um, and one of the reasons I want to also just give a shout out to uh, Bryce Blake and Nagel. Um, we've taped something. He's been making appearances on um, yep. the program. Um, and uh, just talk a little bit about... Uh, your your uh, your approach to the Book of Mormon, and uh, what you hope to get out of this whole uh, yeah, I gotta I gotta say that having the idea of doing uh, doing a reading of the Book of Mormon, let, let me preface this. When I was reading the Quran, I'm I'm reading an English translation. I know that it was originally in classical Arabic, and so how am I going to read the Quran? I I couldn't just read the copy that was given to me, the one English translation, because there's a lot in there that doesn't make sense. And when I compared that to a half a dozen other translations, whenever I had a question, whenever something seemed iffy, I had five other five other versions online that I could switch to and check out that verse. What do they translate it as? And it's surprising how different the translations are. And sometimes it takes all six of them to figure out what the hell it's saying. Mm -hmm. That's how clear the Quran is, right? But but it, then. To make sure I got it right, it wasn't good enough that I had to go ch check out the tafsirs, you know. But I had to then do a video meeting where I'm talking to a few. Um, th there would be anywhere from, you know, two to ten Arabic-speaking former or uh, Islamic apostates, okay. and and on rare occasions I would have an actual believer on. Uh, and in one case, we had a believer on for like three episodes, and he gave up. He became an apostate from being on that show, mm. which I think is huge. It's just some people have lost their faith in Islam just by reading the Quran in English and realizing that somehow the poetry that may have existed, the, the verse that may have existed in Arabic doesn't exist in English. And when you read it in English, you realize this is stupid. <laughs> mm. So now I'm talking with all these people who were raised in Islam. They know what the interpretations are. And that's important because let's say you were born in, in Punjab. And so you've known Muslims, you've known Sikhs, you've known Hindus, but you've never met a Christian in your life. Would you know? If you, if you got a copy of the Bible, you read the Bible, you wouldn't know what a trinity is. And you would never have any reason to believe that the serpent of the garden was Satan because neither of those things are expressed in the Bible. Those are interpretations that you're supposed to just assume culturally that are not written in there. So I knew that, that the Quran would have that too. And of course, we, we have encountered a number of cases like that. So now I've got people who are raised in this tradition who know these interpretations and can clarify all of these for me. And we spent, I think, three and a half years reading the Quran this way. Which was great fun, and I'm I'm glad we did it. And I'm going to compile all my notes on that into my third book, "An Infidel Reads the Quran." Mm. But getting into the Book of Mormon was delightfully different because it is English. The only more original version than what I have is the the version that was a that was first written down before they started doing spell checking because it was written so very 
badly. It's written awfully. It's <laughs> such a dumb book. I mean, it is clear that the book was written by someone in the 1800s pretending to be from, from 2,600 years earlier, right? But 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 this is the reformed Egyptian he's supposedly translating from. None of this makes any sense. The, the verbiage he's using, you would not, could not have gotten from translating out of Egyptian from any form. The these and the thous and in so much and all of these other words, durst not that all of the ridiculous terms that he takes from from King James English that could not have been derived from Egyptian. This is a guy making it up as he goes along. And he's not really smart about it. But the thing is, is that, that people are not really as smart as they think they are. Uh, a, a profound wisdom moment from Men in Black, the movie. Yeah, a person is smart. People are dumb, panicky, dangerous animals. And you know it. <laughs> 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 hmm. Hmm. Uh, you know, I, it's, I'm, 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 you know, folks, I, I just, okay, why, Steve, are you having R in here? He's, he's making, he's, he's making light of our scriptures. And I'm like, well, you know, this is the thing. Your kids and your grandkids are watching people like Aaron. And I think you need to know what's out there. And I'm not, you know, this, and, and, and Aaron hit, does a public service when he does expose a lot of bad things in bad religion. And I, I think you do a good service, but I also think because you're consistent, you, you've you've gone through all the different holy texts, and so you're being totally fair about it. And this is the thing: if there's no God and there's no angels and there's no supernatural, then Aaron's explanation is probably the most likely explanation. What do you say to that? Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, my my thought is that um, uh, what is it? Occam's Razor. No, it's not yeah. Occam's Razor. It's uh, I forget what the, I forget who the the guy that it's attributed to. He, but it's Pascal. Pascal. Oh, yeah, wager. Pascal's wager. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So it's better to believe in God just in case there is a God. But that didn't work. Mm -hmm. it, it works in an entirely Christian-dominated society if you're not aware of other religions. But it doesn't work when you consider Islam, because Christians are going to hell. They're going to Muslim hell. And the Muslims are going to Christian hell. Mm -hmm. And so God, if there was one, allowed a billion Christians to go to hell because they were misinformed. Or he allowed a billion Muslims to go to hell because they were misinformed. And he's judging them not over whether they're good or pe bad people. He's judging them over whether or not they believed, knowing that he didn't give anybody sufficient reason to believe and certainly not reason enough to, to distinguish one true religion from all of the others but he's going to damn you forever of unrelenting ridiculously over-the-top torture simply because you didn't buy the nonsense story that was being sold to you by the clergy in your in your hometown that's it yep yep i um I, I definitely uh, uh, completely get where you're coming from that. And that's uh, that was uh, definitely something that really spoke to me. Like uh, Christopher Hitchens said, Pascal's wagers is ridiculous because if God God is all knowing and if he's like saying like, well, I'm just going to say I believe in God because what have I got to lose? It's a gamble. God knows your heart. You're probably going to hell. So even if you accept the wager, don't work that way. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, and, and so that, those are those are that's why there's a lot of weak arguments in favor of religion and Christianity. And see can what, I address one of them at the, at oh, the please moment do, that, please just, do. that comes up? Yeah. The idea that that I, I I only declare myself to be an atheist, that I secretly know that God exists, okay, but I pretend that he doesn't because I love sin. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what the hell is sin, right. first off? Right. And second, if you're a Christian, sin all you want to. All the sins can be forgiven if you but believe. But if you don't believe, then it doesn't matter how good you are, because the only sin that will not be forgiven is the sin of disbelief. So the only way to really make sure to piss off God is to say that you don't believe in him. Mm. So if I loved sin, I'd be a Christian. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. Go 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 to a church that's what believes in once saved, always saved, and sin away. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so but um but yeah, and that's and that, again, this is just this is garbage theology. This is bad thinking. And uh, that's unfortunately is what infects evangel evangelical Christianity is bad theology, bad thinking, and very, very weak arguments. And this is the thing. Uh Christian evangelical Christianity is is has is very likely leading is going to become a dead end, and Aaron's Aaron's probably already said it already is a dead end. Uh, but it's it's into, it can often lead to an intellectual dead end. That is why some of the best and brightest people in the church are leaving. That is why some of the top atheist YouTubers and podcasters and writers and influencers often come from an evangelical background. And what makes them all in common with each other is that they're very smart, and they're inquisitive. And they ask questions and they're told by their pastors, don't go there. Well, I was told that too. And I said, no, I'm going there, man. You ain't nobody going to tell me no priest, no bishop, no pope, no pastor is going to get in the way of me diligently seeking the truth. That's why I never, ever joined a church, even as a kid. I refused to join a church because I don't believe in any institution that would have that kind of sway over me. Now I've made for a lonely journey for a long time, and I was kind of viewed as this weird Christian. Yeah. Um, but that, that that's the thing. We need more people like that because unfortunately, the, the, the we're having a brain drain in the church. And unless we address these things, they're just going to keep on watching your programs and they're going to watch Matt Dillahunty. And you know, I used to watch the atheist experience every Sunday night, but I have to tell you, dude. After a while, when you keep on getting these Christians calling in saying, oh, no, the slavery, the Bible doesn't, God doesn't condone slavery. The Bible doesn't condone slavery. And then that just goes and destroys them. And all these people are doing is they're just parroting what their pastor said from the pulpit. And they come on Matt's program, they get blown out of the water. I'm like, that gets old after a while. You know, that's the whole problem, dude, is that you, you keep on, you keep on engaging bad arguments all the time. So, so I'm watching this thing on Herschel Walker. Yes where he gets on public TV and announces, well, if we came from apes, why are there still apes? How dumb the, the, the average person is, how stupid the average person is. And then remember that half of them are stupider than that. <laughs> right? Yeah. So that, that's a valid point, especially at election time, mm -hmm. when we're so close to the 50% mark on so many things. And, and, and the idiocy that I hear from politicians is so blatant. I mean, like, you're definitely in in the lower thirty percent of people. Now I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the, you know the people I'm hearing comment. You said this in public, being recorded, shamelessly, not even knowing there was anything wrong with what you said. How the hell are people electing somebody this damn dumb? Hmm. Yeah, uh, I, you know, I, this, I I thought foolishly, foolishly when I was a child. That the reason people got elected to positions of leadership, just think about how stupid this is. I'm a little boy. I was like 10 or 11 years old when the Watergate thing happened. And I was thinking that the reason that, that, that Nixon got elected or that anybody gets elected is because they're smart. They're smarter than the rest of the people. The people say, hey, we want this guy to represent us. We want this guy because he's smarter than we are. But that's not happening. We are electing the dumbest people at the bottom of the barrel. And that's disturbing. Hmm. Yeah, uh, the, the, the trends in this country are very disturbing to me as well. And I think I, I would definitely uh, share that with you. Uh, politically, we might not agree with each other 100%, but I definitely identify the same issues that you do. The state of the, of the discourse of this country and how it's just devolved. So bad. That's another important thing that needs to bring up, if you if you don't mind my saying Please so. Do. And everything about the fighting against creationism, it's not a scientific argument. As you know, it's not a religious argument. It's a political argument. That's all it ever was. The thing that inspired me to become an activist was when I was talking to a bunch of Reconstructionists who were bragging that they had already, you know, all of their congregations had voted together as a block in order to install certain evangelical Christians at every level of state and federal government. And they were there hoping to overturn our representative de democracy and replace it with a theocracy. And it was very terrifying the way that they were describing this. And they've come very close to actually doing that, which is deeply alarming to me. We are still on the verge of that happening unless we're all very conscious and all of the, and and everybody votes because we all know 
that the extreme right-wing religious conservatives, they're all going to vote. So don't give me the, both sides are just as bad. Don't give me the, don't vote, it's a broken system. I don't want to hear it because I don't want to be living under a theocracy. Vote. Yeah, Whatever so... your bullshit excuse is, vote anyway, because it's the only way to change the system is to put better people in office, right? Put better policies in. I don't agree with anybody about everything. Okay, nobody's going to. But can we make it so where it's not that you automatically dismiss everything I say simply because I announced that I'm a leftist? Because it shouldn't matter that I'm a leftist. But if you're going to tell me that that that, that although all the faults in the world are because of leftists and that we are all literally the news media saying this. I'm not talking about individuals who may one 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 time or another say that you know all right wing people are Nazis. I'm sure that somebody like that at some point said that. I'm talking about national news agencies who are announcing broadcasting across the country that all Democrats are leftists and that all leftists are devil worshiping cannibals. That were pedophile chemical. Can, this is on the news. Not one case to support that, but it's still on the news. That's what kind of tribalism we have. You're either on the extreme right or you're on the extreme left because everything has to be binary and nobody can talk about policy anymore. No. Nobody votes on policy, no. they vote on R or D, and that's it. That's it. Yeah, unfortunately. Well, D, they don't because they vote on R. They vote R all the way down. When it's D, now we've got problems because if you have the the Republican religious right are all the they're all single issue voters to the most part they're, they're very tribalistic, whereas Democrats include progressives and conservatives and 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 uh, establishment corporatists and they're all over the place and they agree on very little and that's a problem because the Republicans just vote R vote R vote R because we R R is for robot and that's what we do Democrats. All over the board they argue every subject well this is really interesting i'm so glad you're giving your perspective here and again this is a <laughs> this is a non-partisan program but yeah. uh but uh, but this is a place where all views are giving a, an opportunity to be heard and i appreciate you going on that uh that uh yeah the, the, the thing that i wanted to to highlight there is that it doesn't matter what political box you're right. in or what side of the aisle or however you envision that what matters is the policy and the effect that the policy has. So there's a lot of people who will be required by their by their party to vote against this program. But then once that program passes, well, then they want all the benefits of that program. So they sign up their state for that very program, the very program that they voted against because they know what the benefits are going to be. Well, why, why can't we just discuss what the benefits are going to be and vote on that? Mm -hmm. Why does it have to be tribal? Why does it have to be binary? There's such a thing as nuance. It's not just that between black and white, there's gray. There's a spectrum of color in there. There's a whole lot to consider. But unfortunately, I live in a country where people don't consider a whole lot anymore. Yeah, you know, it's sad. And that's part of the purpose of this channel, dude, is it's this is a very diverse audience that I have. I have very conservative. Uh, I have very Mormon, uh, true blue Mormons. I have ex-Mormons. I have LGBTQ people on. I have you, across the board, and and it, this channel shows that it's possible that you could have that this could actually exist. Now, I just I I, I want to be respectful of your time, and I just want to kind of tie a bow a little bit on the Mormon thing, and that and is. So we were talking about reading the Book of Mormon, and I have talked about everything, but that's fine. That's fine, dude. Because <laughs> you know, you're, it's, hey, I got Aaron Ra on my program. Man. I'm going to let him talk whatever he wants to talk about. But but um, I I. I uh, I just talk a little bit about, first of all, you mentioned you're a raised Mormon. Talk a little bit about your mom's faith and what you thought about it growing up, like you were baptized. What was it like to be baptized as a child? And then maybe talk a little bit about the Book of Mormon, however you want to talk about it. Well, I, I remember I was I was baptized on the same day that my grandpa was. And uh, I, 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 I remember wondering what what exactly was the purpose of getting your head dunked in the water. 
if it's the the only thing I could see is that it's supposed to it's supposed to represent something in your mind as part of the like the hypnotic effect of this is the this is the moment that it happened because I, there's a lot of things that happen like 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 the way that I I graduated out of religion the way that everybody graduates out of religion is usually a gradual process you can't put the day on that you were no that you no longer had this belief because a lot of people it's a it's a process you know but with baptism it had to have a moment. So mm -hmm. there's a there's a moment they can pin to you that you put your head under the water, you come back up. And when you come back up, you're no longer who you were. And now you are this new person. You can pretend everything else that you did in the past is forgiven. And that's that's a powerful thing, especially in the age where, where everybody is concerned about cancel culture. Because I know some and I have to say they're leftists, they're Satanists, and they are all about forgiveness interesting they, yeah they are they, they they understand that hey people do bad things but that the, the issue is not whether you you declare that that jesus forgave you right do you acknowledge that you that you did something bad and are you seeking to atone for that and if you are you if you're trying to atone for something you did wrong that that's where forgiveness comes from from atonement and it, it's not the atonement is not a moment; it's a process. Hmm. But if you're on that path, I mean, it begins with an apology. Yeah. It begins with an acknowledgement, which many people can't do. That's true. They, I mean, and the funny thing is that that's a process too. I was once, uh, once upon a time, I was a much worse guy than I am now. But at that time, I didn't know it. Hmm. You know, because you never know when you're the bad guy. And it, but yet years later in my maturity, I would look back on things that I said or did and realize, wow, that was that was a pretty dickish thing for me to do. That was mm. awful. I shouldn't have done that. And and then and now, you know, and, and so the, the best thing to do is, is acknowledge and move on. And it doesn't have to be a public announcement, but you make sure that someone you care about knows that, you know what, I, I realize that this is not this that I don't I certainly don't want to be remembered for that, you know. Move on and fix it. And and you can find forgiveness in your culture, in your community. And if you can't find it in Christianity, join Satanism. Very provocative statement there, sir. That's the most <laughs> fascinating thing about Satanism. The, the great irony is that the Satanists don't believe in Satan, but the Christians do. Uh, you know, <laughs> and, and so I think that's the, the it's it's a very interesting thing I find. It's like, you know, I said, you, you know, people, he's Satanist, he says, they don't really believe he exists. It's just, it, it's a type, it's just a, 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 they're making a point, you know, and yeah. it's it's almost a type of satire. Oh, well, I knew a Satanist in high school and he was this one. Yeah, yeah, the kid was a rebellious punk kid and he was just trying try, try to cause trouble. When you're dealing with modern, like, uh, atheism, it's it's more of an intellectual exercise. Now, there are things that they do that like, Ooh, you know, but uh, I do... Uh, I do understand where they're coming from and understand the mindset and what they're the points that they're yeah, if you've got questions about Satanists, because I've met a bunch of Satanists who didn't have any attachment to anybody. And it's the same thing as when you meet a non-denominational Christian. Yeah. Right. Do you judge Christianity by whatever that non-denominational Christian does or says? Right. You don't. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you have to look at the, you have to look at the, the, the platform of the political party. You have to look at the the ideology expressed in the statement of faith for some religions and yeah. with the with with satanism you look at their tenets and the church of satan and the satanic temple both have their tenets listed online uh, and and in their archives you know their their fact about what they believe what they don't they don't actually have faith based beliefs mm -hmm. like at all they have things they believe in that should be things that we all believe in like you know like like uh, bod bodily autonomy and individuality and rationality you know things of this sort at the same time admittedly they're a troll organization they are out there trolling they're trolling the, yeah. the religion yeah. <laughs> 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 that's right and having that statue fun of doing it. right next to the ten commandments you know it's like <laughs> so i but, loved that <laughs> well i get it i totally get it dude i understand what they're doing and uh and even i gave an invocation on behalf of the satanic temple at the, in the rotunda of the state capitol building in boise idaho Okay, and I was told that there's all these right wing people who fortunately never showed up. In, okay. in Idaho, you can bring your guns into the state yeah. capitol, right? And I was told that there's all these militant groups that were going to be there, and I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to be there, and I know they're going to be good. I know they're going to be there, but hey, this is this is what I believe in. Honestly, I'm standing up for my for human rights as an American citizen. I'm standing up for the 
you know, people always ask me, why would, would you die for something you don't believe in? Well, it's what I do believe in, you know, and I, I believe in human rights. I believe in bodily autonomy. I believe in the, the freedom of religion and the freedom to, to, to think freely, you know, and if I die, if somebody shoots me because they disagree with that, well, then I'm a martyr for my cause. And yeah, I'll die for that. Yeah. And it's I mean, of all the ways you got, you know, you got to die, pick a way. And if, <laughs> yeah. and if I could do it, making a statement for the things I believe in, that's, I think, the best way that's I could go. Probably the, the good way to go. I just have a, you know, we, I, we've got a few more minutes here and I want to be respectful of your time. I just want to know, have you, uh, did you ever have in your life what you could call a spiritual experience? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Tell I was a neo-pagan occultist for a while. Okay. And? Yeah, I, I, I was reborn Christian for a half hour or so. Okay. Uh, I, I'm being a little facetious. It was most of the afternoon anyway. Okay. All right. Yeah. And I asked my friend who later became a Southern Baptist preacher and a, and a principal of a Christian school. Uh, I, I asked him, how do I know that this, this uh, euphoria, this elation that I'm feeling is really the power of Jesus? How do I know that I'm not just fooling myself through some trick of the mind or some other influence? And he grabbed me by both shoulders with a huge beaming smile and said, just keep telling yourself it's Jesus until you believe it. Okay. Yep. And that lie, mm. that admission that the whole thing was make-believe was sufficient to destroy my Christianity in an instant. Wow. Yeah, I'm not Christian anymore. It's like right you, saw, you saw through it right there. Yeah. It's like, okay. It was, uh, it was a few days before of, of deliberation after that before i i decided that I, I don't believe in god anymore okay yeah i was lucky enough that i never believed in the bible because but that was just a crock anyway but um it just made more man-made mythology and that's when i started i thought there was still scientific evidence for psionics for telepathy for uh for astral projection so i mean i, I started getting into transcendental meditation i wanted to personally experience i want to do the scientific experiment i want to experience for myself these these things i want to how how can i become an adept in this art and and see what the truth of it really is and i explored that for a while and i realized that the power of faith is amazingly deceptive it is the most deceptive and auto-deceptive means that there is. I mean, it causes you like the, the new age people, when they read an aura, for example, they're training themselves to see just beyond what their eyes can see. And it took me a while to realize, see just beyond what you're, that means you're making it up. Oh, okay. Yeah. Use your imagination. And then, then I've heard Christians use the exact same argument that you know, when they're looking at, uh, fossil evidence of a transitional species and they'll say well if you use your imagination you can still see this trait there and so it's not transitional at all that's telling me that you're going to use your imagination to deny the evident reality in front of you and so then it took me the longest time to to figure out that the experiences and i had some profound otherworldly kind of experiences okay. i had encounters with extra dimensional entities multiple wow. times and at the time, I was very impressed by them. And um, there was just a time when I had to reflect painfully back on my past and realize that those things didn't really happen, even mm. though I remember them. And I remember them with other people because some of them were shared experiences. Interesting. Yeah. Then, amazingly, through the power of the internet, I, re I discovered a couple of those people who were in those past experiences. The two most profound ones, I found both of those people. Neither one of them even remembered it at all. Interesting. Much less remembered it the same way. Hmm. So did I manufacture all of that in my own mind? Hmm. Did it? Was it something that only resonated with me and maybe not so much with the other person? Maybe, maybe the other person just realized they were just pretending at the time and I didn't. So I'm just part of a, I just deceived myself. Because that's what that's what faith is. It's self deception. It's pretending to know what you don't know. Hmm. Well, I appreciate you sharing your very passionate views, and uh, just kind of coming on here and you know being R and raw, which that's exactly <laughs> what I wanted you to be. Um, I just want to ask you: Do, do you um, are you you've interacted with other Christians, and you had mentioned one that you had you said you almost call him a friend. Can you just tell me, uh, are there Christian apologists, 
evangelical in particular, that you think are people of integrity that you you do feel like, okay, I don't agree with you, but I think you're you're not a you're not a charlatan. Not a one. Not a one. To be to be a religious apologist, at least in regards to creationism versus evolution. Uh, I'm, I'm taking out the creation. I'm not. Talk, let's not talk about creationism. I'm talking okay. about just in like the inspiring philosophy guy. Um, people like that that are willing to engage you in the naturalistic realities of the world. Uh, do you feel that there are some that have in your mind some credibility, or that? Yeah, I don't know a whole lot about inspiring philosophy except the one debate that we did in okay. which. I had heard from other people that his tactic was to redefine things, which I see a lot with okay. creationists. Okay. You know, they'll redefine a term. Okay. I've had debates with people over what, you know, whether whether evolution is a thing and the, the definitions that they're coming up with are not definitions that you'll find in any textbook, textbook ever. Right. Uh, okay. Yeah. Right. And so I, I have to correct the misdefinitions. I had one debate where I said, let's open with definitions just to make sure we're using the same language. My opponent refused. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On the grounds he said that let let's just use these words how we want to and let the audience figure out what they think they should mean. Mm -hmm. No, we know what these words mean. We have textbooks to say what they mean. We're not going to be making up other. We're not going to be straw manning. We're not going to be equivocating. We're not going to be basing arguments on logical fallacies. But they do. The, the, the theological argument is always a logical fallacy. So when we're talking to the apologist. They will redefine whatever. So in the, the debate that we had was, is Christianity dangerous? Yes. Mm -hmm. And he switched the argument to, is uh, is inherent, or what was it inherent? Implicit. Is implicit religiosity dangerous? Or intrinsic. I think it was intrinsic. intrinsic. That's what yeah, it is. Yeah, intrinsic yeah, yeah. religiosity. And I remember when I, when I, when I, I'd never heard the term before. So I'm on the debate stage live. I'm getting this. I'm like, this is just completely ignoring the entire history of Christianity, the bloodiest religion ever, right? You're just ignoring everything to say is implicit religiosity. Was so when I read it after the debate, I get to read on implicit religiosity or intrinsic, intrinsic. excuse me, intrinsic religiosity, and I realize one, it's not specifically Christian. So Christianity is no different than any other religion when it's intrinsic religiosity. And the intrinsic means that the entire culture believes the same thing, whatever it is, and there's no contest on it. And the implication also is that there's no action on it. It's just everybody believes the same thing, and that's it. And so you don't get the conflict. So is it dangerous then? Well, in, in that case, like I said, Christianity is no different than any other religion. If everybody believes the same thing and they're not acting on it, then it's just it's just this background thing. But if you act on it, and if you act specifically on Christianity, well, then it is dangerous, extremely. And I showed scientific studies that show that, that even, even intrinsic religiosity, when applied to Christianity or really any other religion, but intrinsic religiosity is still dangerous to, the, to a child's ability to discern what is real and what is not, and how to, how to, to, to hear a story that may be a folk tale about you know, knights slaying dragons or whatever, and you think that they're and then witches and all, and you think that witches and dragons and everything are real because the Bible says so. Okay. So you can't discern fact from fiction, where other people not raised that way can. So even intrinsic religiosity is dangerous. But as I said, he had to intrinsic religiosity. Yeah, he had to change the definition okay. entirely in order to have any ground in the argument at all. Okay. Well, I appreciate you clarifying that because it was an interesting, I, I had vague recollection of probably coming across it in the past and I kind of rewatched your interaction. And and so I thought that was interesting. Okay. Well, I, I, dude, this was fun today. Did you, did you enjoy the conversation? I did. I did. I've always got a ton of other stuff I have to do, so I do have to go, but I yeah. but, uh, appreciate, appreciate being on. So folks, I just want to remind you to don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the notification button for when a new episode comes out. I want to also remind you that if you'd like to support the channel, there will be links in the description to support the channel on PayPal and Patreon, as well as the merch store, mormonbookreviews.com. Got this beautiful coffee mug in the mail the other day. Uh, check out that. I do appreciate all of those of you who are financially supporting this channel. And once again, Aaron Ra, the man, the myth, the legend. Thanks again for coming on the program. Thank you much. And don't forget, all the voices of the Restoration will be heard here on Mormon Book Reviews.